restart my recording. Okay, so today's lecture 14 about dimensional reduction. And um, also I want to highlight the PCA uh, in this really big family of algorithms. So, uh, so uh, dimension reduction, it's really in this background uh, of the issues called curse of dimensionality. So in many real world um, tasks, you actually have many, many features and you don't know which one is the good one. Um, and, but using more features, increasing the number of features, uh, it will not always increase uh, the prediction uh, performance. And also in practice, in many cases, the inclusion of more features actually hurt, hurt the prediction performance. And also theoretically, you can actually prove the number of training examples required and to have a uh, guarantee some kind of uh, error bond, it increases exponentially with the dimensionality of P. So uh, let's just give you a first example, like a drug screening. Uh, you try to um, like uh, see which the, the properties of different uh, compounds and then for a target binding uh, task. And then this is a very old data. I just want to make it try to make a point. So uh, there are many different features you actually can to use to describe a, uh, a molecule or compound. And then there, so in this case, you can tell, and this is extremely large, like P is about uh, 139K. Um, it's just really, really large, but the N is extremely small. So in this case, the number of uh, examples is only about 2,500. And then if we consider this, uh, if it's a two class problem and there's the positive N is just about 200 and the rest is inactive. So in this kind of uh, imbalanced uh, task, I mean the positive um, instances are normally uh, more important. And then you can tell, I mean, this positive samples are only 200 and the number of features is like almost 200k so and then in this um in one of this paper talk about this uh this data uh, they actually showed i mean even though they're almost like 130 uh, 140k features and when you just uh, have about like 70 features the performance is already kind of decreased a lot uh, so, which means even though there are so many features, but there are really very, very low, little uh, small set of features that is relevant, that is helpful. And then the other is very classic, this uh, leukemia data. Um, and we actually talk about it when we talk about rich regression and less so regression. And I, I believe this one, uh, the N is about 100 size and the P is about like 20K size. So it's a very classic task, like gene expression or ex RNA expression based uh, disease um, prediction tasks. So it's 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 very it's a norm there. I mean, there are just more features than uh, more uh, than the number of samples, and uh, um, less classic, but used to be very classic in this type of feature selection uh, regime is the te text analysis. So used. Before the deep learning um, like getting popular, people always use backup words representation. And then normally backup words representation and they, you have like 100K and it's very normal to have 100 key size of features. And then when we don't have enough label data, I mean like for example, this very classic uh, rotor or 20 news, news group data, and you have only about like 20K. So this is your N and then this is your P. And without like the current, this kind of uh, good language model, before you just trim your classifier based on whatever uh, categorization labels you have, in this case, like 20 news groups. So you have just about 20K articles. And then how do you, I mean, in uh, various studies before deep learning, uh, it's, do you, it really doesn't help I mean, when you have more than, when you select about 300 or maybe 200 features, all the rest of features are not very helpful. So how do you select that group of features 
and then it's uh, it's a very nice way uh, if you can select a good informative subset of features it's a very nice way to conquer this cursor dimensionality uh, issues and then uh, again the other one we covered is this movie uh, review based uh, revenue prediction and they are like ps 30 k and it's about 13 uh, 1700 so uh, yeah so in that we used um, elastic net uh, it's a re revised version of lasso based method all right so then our focus in this session is dimensional reduction. So what is dimensional reduction is uh, we aim to choose an optimal set of features of lower dimensionality to improve the prediction performance. Prediction accuracy, so this figure tries to show you there's some kind of um, sweet spot. I mean, in the beginning, I mean, there are not enough features. And when you have enough, like, good features, and then, uh, when you add more and you're it's really not necessary to add more this is also for the purpose of uh all kim's razor if you ever heard about it right so when you can use a simpler model to implement a task a simpler hypothesis to perform a prediction uh you should pick a simpler uh, version um, as much much as you can and it's for the interpretability um, purpose, and also it's it's just easier. It's easier to explain, easier to check uh, simpler models. All right, so uh, uh, yeah, so this page trying to show, uh, it's more a, a good, better summary like uh, what I said in the previous previous page. So the dimensional reduction gives you simpler models, and the simpler models uh, are easier, uh, simpler to use. It normally involves lower computational cost and easier to train, uh, less sensitive to noise, easier to explain, and also hopefully when it, you have enough, it also generalizes better uh, because you, you don't um, fit, you don't overfit right, to noise, to noisy features. All right, so uh, in the higher, uh, from a higher perspective, we can group the dimensional reduction into two kinds. One kind is the feature section. The other kind is feature extraction. So the feature, um, we can think about feature section is really just I pick the a subset from my original features. Yeah, let me actually use H, not using Y. It's just a subset of my features, and I select those. And feature extraction is uh, I it's it's doing mapping. It's it's uh, designing a parameterized or designing a function in this case i write it as f and then it to create a new feature new lower dimensional space uh hopefully that's um it's can like it's provide wide better representation so we can even think about all of the current representation learning uh are mostly uh, uh can be categorized by uh the left uh, feature extraction uh, family all right, so I will first talk about feature selection. So feature selection, again, so I try to select the relevant features from my, my original feature input space to build a better, faster, and easier to understand models. And so I try to reduce from the P into P prime. So uh, we can group the feature selection method uh, into uh, three different families. So one is called filtering-based family, uh, wrapper-based family, and embedding-based family. And the filtering-based approach for performing a uh, feature selection is the most simple uh, classic feature selection. They try to, uh, the, the essence of the method is to rank the features or feature subsets independent of the predictor you try to, um, uh, you try to use uh, in the downstream task. So, um, so for example, you can just use variance to rank your features. So those kind of univariate approach, I mean, they just rank each variable at a time and then sort all the variable together. There are also approach uh, rank feature subsets um, uh, and then compare the subsets of features. And uh, let's see uh, more detailed. Uh, all right, so um, the filter based approach is to rank features and with, without the uh, dependence on the predictors. And so this is the filter-based. And the wrapper-based method 
it's, it's a wrap. It's on top of a predictor. It uses a predictor to select good features or good feature subsets. And the embedding-based method, we actually talk about it at the lasso and the elastic net based method. They're doing like both feature selection and prediction in one algorithm. So that's the embedding, uh, embedded um, feature selection approach. So let's see uh, just a very classic univariate fe uh, future uh, method like a t-test. So I will not talk about the, the details of the t-test. We can think about I'm trying to, to classify to uh, to classify my samples into two classes. If according to the feature one, so this is my uh, feature one, uh, so xi, I can just plot uh, the histograms uh, of, in terms of these features. So this is my x, uh, the distributions, and then the red representing uh, the class one and the blue represent class minus one. And this class really uh, tells me that this feature um, have this very overlapped distribution of two class samples. So intuitive, it gave me, uh, tells me this is not very informative uh, that helped me to separate the class one and class minus one. So if for another feature like XJ, and I, again, just plot uh, like um, distribution and then uh, x-axis is that feature values, um, and then y is the density, and off. And then you can actually tell, I mean, use, if using xj, and it has really nice separations of uh, the class one and class minus one, so this give me intuitive feelings that uh, this xj is more informative to separate the two class. So this t-test essentially captured that by using to Gaussian distributions to um, approximate the class one and class two, and then using this, the differences of the mean of the Gaussian and to inform you how good is that feature xi or feature xj. Uh, so that's, that's one way. There are actually many, many other ways. So uh, not just a feature at a time, you can also do feature group at a time. So for example, group correlation, uh, there's something called Markov blanket and it really tells you how good a set of features all together according to some predefined, uh, it's, it's mostly based on information theorem uh, de defined uh, metrics. So this type of future method are very fast and they're generic. They're not bundled with any predictors, um, but some people have to criticize that because the features selected are not optimized for a specific learner that they care. So they are mostly used as pre-processing for other downstream um, steps. So there's a big, big, like really many, many different kinds of future methods. The scikit-learn uh, provides you a lot of, and then uh, this just give you a, a, a few examples from this paper. So the most classic, I think people use a lot is the chi-square and also, um, I think mutual information is used a lot in the text uh, feature selection. And um, yeah, there, there are actually like many, many, like they have different properties and there are different pros and cons. So this is the filtering group of feature selector. And then the second group is called a wrapper. Uh, wrapper method is uh, like on top of a predictor and using a predictor to, uh, uh, to measure a feature, a, a group of features at a good uh, for, for me, uh, for my predictor or not. So uh, yeah, this diagram you can tell, I mean, uh, assuming you can uh, get uh, a different kind of uh, feature subsets. I mean, this is like your subsets A, maybe subs, let me do X. So X sub A, X sub two, X sub uh, three, and then so on, so more four. And then you just feed in the selected feature subset to the predictors. And then let the predictor, predictor give you a validation, um, give you um, validation performance. You fit into the wrapper and wrapper select according to the prediction performance. Uh, and um, this essentially the learner, the best predictor is considered as a black box. And uh, you use the, the black box output as a scoring uh, function. 
uh, and uh, there, there are really different ways to use um, different predictors. And also the selective features are, are actually, uh, like in the end, it's dependent on the learner you use, right? So, so this task uh, is actually MP hard because I'm trying to, so in the end, I have P features. I try to get all the possible subsets and then rank them. So using a predictor. So if you think about it, there are a total of P features. You try to select each subset of um, features. And then this, I think this gives you two to the P possible uh, subset features feature subsets, and then this is huge to measure. So which means there's no way you do a brutal force uh, to enumerate all the possible subsets and then feed into a predictor using the predicted performance to rank them. That's just, that's just not possible. So people have uh, invented, uh, use many classic um, combinatorial search search strategies to try to solve this approximately. So for example, you can use Grady type of fit, uh, like forward section, you pick the first best feature when you compare uh, all the like just single features and then condition on the best feature you just selected, you select the next best feature or you do the other way. So you um, select the feature to, from the whole group of features to be removed and you can also do the top K, um, the beam search. They're just very, a lot of different kinds, uh, combinatorial search based, this um, wrapper approach. All right, then the embedding based approach. Embedding, like we already talked about, this is just one predictor can perform feature selection and prediction at the same time. So uh, very classically, we talk about uh, the, the one we already covered is uh, lasso, like we skipped it, and elastic net, and they all, um, they are belonging to this, this group called embedding based feature selection approach. Uh, so in practice, uh, no method is universally better. And uh, feature selection is also not always necessary but it's a very good practice, uh, especially for those tasks has smaller and uh, smaller labeled N and larger P. Yeah. All right, so we finished the uh, feature section group. Now let's jump to feature extraction group. So in the end, feature extraction is to map my raw feature into a different feature space using some kind of functional mapping like an F function or G function. And hopefully the generated uh, K, this dimension, it's small because you can, the designer can pick the dimensionality that you want to project upon. All right, so um, the most classic um, feature extraction, this, uh, like we said, we need to design that F function uh, to project, right? From the regional uh, P space. Um, yeah, then you write as RP. So from the RP space into assuming this RK using this F function. Yeah, so there are many different kinds of F, right? We already learned it. So the simplest F can be just a linear, uh, linear production. And this uh, linear combination, uh, it's uh, particularly uh, pretty uh, nice because they are simpler and they're analytically uh, like also uh, easier to do the calculation. So if we assume it's a linear la layer, we can just write it as this matrix form, right? So assuming this F is Fx, it's just a U transform uh, X uh, projection. So let's, let's see the dimensionality here. So U transposition X, and it's my uh, F, Fx. So X is a uh, P times one um, vector, and then the U, so it will be a, actually U, U transposition and right here, it's a K times P. 
and then the U matrix essentially is um, oh this one writes as the N okay let me also make it no let's let's still keep the P sorry let me change this to P uh, so the the uh, dimensionality of this U is P times K it's essentially project or maybe let me even use H just to echo the um, yeah P times K is yeah P times K so uh, I think maybe by now you a little bit start to uh, kind of connect to what we show you in the multi-layer perceptron each multi-layer perceptron layer actually can it's a inner it's a linear projection right it project from the um, input space into output space and that weight matrix is exactly the input size times output size and this u you can think about it's one possible uh, projection layer um, so here yeah so I'm just doing a p times k k is much smaller than p all right so there are many many uh, different kinds of uh, linear projections so this kind of uh, feature you can think about we can call that um, embedding or a lower dimensional embedding um, so here I call this feature extraction so from a mathematical point of view finding this optimal fx projection is uh, it's normally formulated as a objective function so what do you use to um, you can formulate it as a loss or cost or uh, uh, some kind of utility type of objective function way um, so there are many different ways um, if you do not want to use the output y uh, output signals the prediction signals uh, yeah sorry again let me use the H I should use H here yeah why is a little confusing so the H so H this I'm generating the H I can have all different kinds of loss function try to learn it right so in the literature you can actually group uh, this the objective function to learn this linear projection into two kinds so one kind is this are uh, it's information loss or we just more um, easier to say is um, reprojection uh, reconstruction law so the goal is to represent the data as accurately as possible so we don't want to lose information in this lower dimensional space so one big group PCA belongs to this group so we try to minimize the loss of information and using this as my objective function to learn the H space so the other way is a um, uh, discriminatory uh, way I mean we're going to we're not going to talk about it uh, so you actually can consider the downstream prediction task so my goal to learn this H representation is to enhance my prediction uh, or predictive um, downstream tasks and so what uh, commonly used this uh, by considering uh, the, the commonly used this linear projection according to that two different loss function um, the first kind is the PCA so it trying to learn this linear projection that preserve the information in my data and that type of specific information I try to preserve is actually variance represented as a variance so the other kind that uh, through the linear projection that to um, maximize my representation uh, with regard to the prediction downstream task is the linear discriminant analysis uh, so it seeks to look for a linear projection that best discriminative uh, discriminate my data so we will not talk about RODA uh, we will only focus on PCA here and also there are many many more kinds of linear projection based uh, method so uh, there's something called ICA uh, so the goal is not to keep information anymore so in my projected space I want to make the features are as independent as possible so that's a different kind of objective right so using this objective people create this algorithm called ICA independent component analysis and uh, there, there are also different kinds of other type of objectives like and they create a really big family of uh, approach so which we cannot cover here so just throw you with this name and 
uh, feel uh, free to check out by yourself. But they are all belonging to this family of trying to learn this linear projection and projecting my uh, from the, this high dimensional raw input space into a lower dimensional space through a linear projection. All right, so now it's PCA. Uh, PCA is a linear dimensional reduction. Uh, in fact, it has a Gaussian assumption behind it. And its objective function is to keep the maximal variance of my data. So keep as much variance as possible um, in my data. So from, um, from my raw data uh, into this um, projected space, I want to my projected representation to keep the maximal variance that from my, uh, my original space, in my original space. And the method to maximize that max variance goal is the angular decomposition based, and the output is principal components. Because I have only 10 minutes, so I will do really, really quick uh, PCA. I will not talk about details of the PCA, so feel free to check out the extra slides if you are interested. All right, so uh, principal component analysis, um, it's, uh, we can summarize it as approximating a higher dimensional data with a lower dimensional linear subspace. And uh, just to show you a figure, so like assuming my uh, data is just, there's two dimensional, I try to look for a one dimensional representation. So from a P equals to two into a K uh, into uh, S1. This is a very extreme case, uh, but it shows you the essence of the task. All right, so first I uh, will uh, widen the data. I should center my data. And then after I center the data, I will try to look for a dimension that keep the variance as much as possible in my data. So how do you uh, look for it? I mean, you can, you know, after your data is centered um, around the, uh, the center, and then which direction keep the variance the most? And this actually eyeball is very easy to, uh, you can just eyeball it. So the one actually captured the most, I mean, if you look at this uh, specific dimension that you captured by this, uh, this red line, and then you project all your points into that red line and the, the, the spreading. So what is variance? I mean, we can think about variance intuitively, just the, the wideness, right? The, the how wide uh, is my data? And it's actually totally kept by this first dimension. So the wideness. So that's an intuitive uh, way to just explain it. Uh, you, can told, you can represent it through equations and then uh, maximize the variance because you can calculate the variance. And then subject to the, uh, you maximize the variance as your objective function and subject to the learned this uh, dimension, the new space they should be orthonormal to each other. And that's exactly the objective function actually PCA uh, optimized upon. And the solution is ending decomposition. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, principal component explains uh, the total variance of your data. And the first principal components explain the most. And then uh, like the second, explain, explain the second to the first, and then uh, until the, the piece, if you have p-dimensional uh, in the raw space, uh, you can actually, you will get um, p-principal uh, components. And then uh, the sorted order um, is according to the amount of variance that principal component explains on your data. And then this one, I tried to show you, I mean, the first principal, component capture the wideness spreading of your data the most. The second dimension captured the rest of the variance because the raw, the, the, the P is two here. So I have two principal components. All right, so uh, now let's actually re rethink about our uh, block views of um, neural networks, right? So I already told you each block you can think about it's a projection you project uh, from the input. So let me just now make it more general. The input is HI and then output is HO. And then through some kind of projection, which is actually linear projection, if you don't, before that uh, nonlinear layers, yeah, let me do this. 
this this H1 uh, to uh, Z2 and the X to uh, Z1, each one of them is a linear project projection and which you can think about uh, what PCA does, very similar to PCA does, but different is PCA optimize a special kind of loss function. Uh, and here I'm not optimized only according to my own block, I'm optimizing according to this really the last loss module uh, signals, uh, that's the one I'm optimizing. But actually, in fact, nothing stops me uh, to using some kind of PCA type or like a like type of loss function. So I want to keep information as much as I can from input to this embedded lower dimensional space, right? All right, so that's exactly what uh, autoencoder trying to uh, implement, trying to capture. So you have your input dimension and you project it into a hidden dimension then you can actually project it back. And then this is from the X to the H, then to the X hat. And then the loss function we can, uh, we, we, we just designed this specific loss function is to minimize the X hat versus the X input. And this type of loss is autoencoder loss. Uh, we also call it, uh, actually it's more popularly called a uh, reconstruction loss. It just essentially forces the hidden layer units to be good, um, as good as possible to keep information as much as it can um, for the reconstruction of the, the input, um, the input X. Uh, we can explode this and this is the autoencoder structure and used, uh, it's very, very popular and it's mostly used in the image, um, like, yeah, it's almost a norm now, it's a norm. So we already talked about uh, convolution block and now uh, this reconstruction loss derived encoder uh, decoder structure is another very popular deep learning um, like uh, modules. So the encoder uh, essentially compress input into a latent space. Uh, normally you're, you're really smaller and H equals to FX and the decoder reconstruct the input from the latent space back into the uh, input space. So we can represent there is original, it's the uh, handwritten image into the H, and then we use a decoder, reconstruct it into a output. So hopefully it still looks as like uh, a four. And then we use this reconstruction differences as the signal to train, to get an encoder and decoder weights. And um, there are many variations of this type of auto encoder decoder um, like uh, flows. So for example, the very classic is called the denoising autoencoder. So rather than input a clean image, uh, I input both the clean image uh, and a little bit noise. So in this case, you can tell I'm having this noisy too by adding the Gaussian noise. And then I project this using this encoder projection uh, from assuming this is the uh, XP space, and this goes to XH space, uh, no, RP and RH. So it's from the P space, go to a low dimension. Uh, yeah, let's use H, and then from the H, and go back to this P space. And I try to uh, minimize the differences uh, of this uh, noise input versus my denoised um, image. So, and and by this way, I actually can use this type of autoencoder decoder to use it for denoising, right? So it's it's not just for, um, it's really expanding. Uh, there, there are so many different kinds of applications. You can use this autoencoder decoder structure. Uh, denoising is one way, um, using to generate good uh, representation, like then feed this RH into some downstream task for classification. That's almost the most classic uh, use. Uh, sorry, classic use. And like, and then I go to maybe a, a maybe a CN layer or some other modules. I mean, I try to classify it as two. I mean, just classification. So that's the other usage is for prediction, and there are just many different kinds. Yeah. And also the who can be the encoder or decoder um, 
in the neural network family, it goes beyond what I just covered. So I just covered is this feature uh, extraction, this majority of the feature extraction are the linear projections. But in the neural network, uh, this big family, we, we don't, I mean, we actually, uh, the majority of the encoder structures are nonlinear. They can, they model, they can model nonlinear dependency. You can also use convolution blocks uh, as one of the block in your encoder module. Um, and uh, there are just many different kinds of uh, encoder structures, especially uh, now, like um, in deep, like in the text learning. I mean, um, you can also have some kind of transformer based encoder, um, like um, RNN based in, uh, encoder. I mean, the decoder can be also, uh, there are different kinds. So it's really, really powerful, this encoder decoder workflow. Uh, but the essence is I try to from the raw uh, raw space try to learn a better feature representation and then use that representation to reconstruct um, hopefully and this reconstruction laws hopefully guide me to get a good RH space yeah all right so uh, we are really now um, in very uh, into more and more into the hardcore uh, topics of deep learning and um, and next, uh, hopefully next week, I can start to talk about uh, deep learning on uh, text data. And uh, so before that, I mean, the reason why I quickly go over the dimension reduction is this is a very fundamental topic of uh, for classic machine learning. So the linear type of uh, feature extraction and this um, really simple filter or wrapper based uh, feature selection it's still um, very relevant to the real world uh, task. If your, your data is not as um, nicely labeled as other, as the deep learning um, popular data, like a text or imaging data. So in many medical domains, feature extraction or feature ex uh, uh, mapping, PCA based and uh, filtering based feature selection are the workhorses to analyze those data. Uh, so this is the last page, uh, the, the page before the last page, and then I, I covered the PCA and also feature selection and a little bit auto uh, like encoder decoder, but uh, uh, actually there are many more interesting topics in relevant to this uh, session today. For example, Tisney and UMAP, um, they are uh, they are the one people use the most now for doing uh, data visualization. So if you, the data visualization has a, a different goals versus our prediction-based uh, generalization goals. And the, there are so many advances recently on uh, this data visualization, embedding-based data visualization. So if you're interested, uh, I will put some extra notes. I mean, uh, feel free to check it out. So for example, like we can uh, see if we use uh, PCA to, uh, just plot like um, uh, project the MNIST data in this two-dimensional space, it's still pretty noisy. But if we use a TSNI, it has provided you this really nice uh, cluster kind of uh, shape structures. So uh, TSNI is extremely powerful visualization tools. And UMAP, uh, the recently uh, pre uh, proposed UMAP, it's uh, actually faster. So uh, I think this is all I want to talk about today. And then I actually have al almost 80 extra slides to talk about PCA and feel free to check out.